virgins. Uh, let me just give you a tiny sort of a biography, but in short, basically, Christopher Hitchens is described as an intellectual polemicist, uh, uh, a journalist that, I mean, a journalist was most of his career. Uh, he was uh, somebody who uh, started uh, in the UK originally with a very uh, uh, left-wing uh, uh, publications uh, uh, and uh, uh, the magazine International Socialism, which had basically Trotskyan sort of uh, Trotskyan ideas. You know, they didn't, they said no to Washington and no to Moscow, both. So they didn't view the states, uh, Soviet states as uh, the workers' representative, basically, right? So uh, he started his career in that, and he came from a sort of a middle-class family. His father was a uh, was a military man. He apparently his whole life referred to his father as the commander because he was a uh, who was a military man who fought the Nazis, and he apparently played a major role in a, a naval battle, helped to sink a Nazi ship, if I'm not mistaken, or a Nazi submarine. As you mentioned in our introduction, for people who missed, he has a famous brother called uh, uh, Peter Hitchens, and uh, before this is early. Christopher Hitchens, before he moved to the right, which we're going to discuss in plenty later on. So sorry, would you uh, say, so eight, he was famous from what, starting the 80s? Uh, 90s. 90s. He was famous. And he but was he, like, a, yeah. he was considered a full out leftist, socialist kind of person at that point. Yes, he, to be a, yeah, you could say even in 80s, he was already like within the leftist circles as well. He was mm -hmm. very famous. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, exactly. He was a, very much to, in those days, you would describe him as an international socialist, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. A very Trotskyan in a way, you know, that was for, uh, and we'll get into it. He was very much pro European Union. His brother, Peter Hitchens, is the complete opposite of. He, the early years of Christopher Hitchens. He was a very conservative, isolationist, sort of uh, Anglican. Like, he, he believed in Christianity. Oh, Christopher wow. Hitchens, uh, anti, you know, anti-religion. He co described himself as anti faith not just atheist. And, and his brother is younger the, or older? Younger. His brother yeah. is just slightly younger. And uh, his brother is very isolationist. He was very internationalist. Uh, he, that's even in his later career. So, uh, you know, completely opposite, which, I mean, may uh, explain something about uh, both of their characters because they both seem to sort of stand apart within even their own communities. Like Peter Hitchens is a conservative that is... Uh, basically, not a lot of conservatives, you know, he, because to be honest, because he's somewhat principled in my view, just like Christopher Hitchens, other conservatives don't usually like him because he's got a line and he sticks to it, you know. They are very much the, the type of thinkers that have first principles and everything should be, uh, like every, every thought they have, every idea they have comes back to their first principles and so on. So, uh, yeah, basically, early years, he was a, a you know, international socialist. Uh, he, uh, he uh, in 1980s, uh, I think he started going to the U.S. and later on he moves there and he gets the U.S. citizenship. He starts writing for uh, uh, The Nation. I think he goes to The Nation through The New Statesman, which, which is a left-wing magazine in the uh, U.K., and which is where he meets Gore Vidal, my... Uh, that's the guy who I'm, he's the biggest hero of mine. But anyway, and they, they become friends there. He starts writing for The Nation, which is the left-wing, famous American left-wing magazine. And he's very critical of uh, uh, American foreign policy in general, especially in South America. He's famously, he, he travels South America extensively. He meets with a lot of people who fight against American imperialism and works in a lot of communes and all that. So, you know, he's somebody who uh, actually uh, had a lot of experience doing hardcore journalism of going to. Uh, we just did a video about Glenn Greenwald interview, but he was, uh, you know, people who put their, uh, you, know, you know, they actually go through with this stuff. They are not just tweeting or, by the way, I'm not, we, I, I never claim to be a journalist or anything. 
but you know uh, he actually went to situations oh, I didn't know any of the whole South America stuff that he did first oh, yeah. time I'm hearing about that Oh he was very uh yeah he was he's I think his left wing credentials was really built on his reportings on uh American foreign policy in South and Central America and the negative consequences of that and no even idea. Uh, yeah, and he, but he was always, for example, a supporter of uh, Kurdistani uh, uh, movement, which calls for a creation of a Kurdistan, separate Kurdistan state, or uh, at least some autonomy for Kurd, Kurds, Kurdish people uh, in Iraq. And he was always anti Saddam. So he, on the in the first Gulf War, he was a bit of a you know he, he was a bit uh, he was uh, still he didn't support the war, but he infamously did an interview in which he said he was very disappointed with the American reaction, which was basically as long as the American casualties are low, we are okay with it. Uh, that was his main criticism, and then when uh, later on Clinton comes into office and uh, famously bombs Sudan. Uh, he describes that as a terrorist action and a war crime. Uh, you know, so he, even in the 90s, he's still very much located ideologically and at least in his uh, writing uh, within the left. And he does a lot of debates with uh, uh, Chomsky, with Gore Vidal. You know, they do a lot of contributions. So he's connected with all the major figures that we know and love from the left, right? Uh, but then... There are all these events, like the Kurdish thing, for example, was always something that he was very much for. And then there is the Bosnia one, in which he says Bosnia was one of the first incidents he found himself uh, siding with the new conservatives. When the Yugoslavian war happened, again, he was, this is interesting because he's viewed as this guy who's very, nowadays he's viewed as this guy who was very anti-Muslim or anti-Islamic. But he was actually, when the crisis happened in um, former Yugoslavia, which led to the breakup. He was uh, support, he, he was for the, uh, for the guy who's um, Alija Izet Begovic, I believe, I'm definitely mispronouncing his name. He was a Muslim politician who was, he saw that he had a chance for creating a multicultural Yugoslavia, or, or you're gonna have somebody like Milosevic who wants to basically ethnic cleanse all the other people and just have his own group uh, stay in power. And in, in Yugoslavia case, I think for a lot of people, not just for him, was one of those cases that they saw the intervention as a positive thing. And he, uh, he in an interview, he argued that, well, I, I thought to myself, if some undemocratic fascistic government is uh, like, he said that the left was opposing intervention in Yugoslavia because they said that it would argue further uh, it would further destabilize the region and further uh, escalate the violence. But what I was thinking was that why would I care about undermining and uh, unstabilizing an undemocratic fascistic regime like the ones that was in charge? So there was the so the, this is one of the events that is usually described as his his move from left to the right of politics, that this is one of the early ones that happens in 90s. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, later on, he be, uh, with these events, other events, the Rushdie affair, we get into it in the next segment, with Rushdie affair, and then you have the 9-11. And before 9-11, he was actually very critical of George Bush's policies, including his because George Bush was saying that I'm going to be a non-interventionist. And he was saying that that's not a good idea. You should be interventionist. So maybe there were some signals there that he would support the Iraq war. But then you have 9-11 happen. And then uh, the Afghanistan in, uh, invasion and the Iraq invasion. And he became, in the words of Chris Hedges, this is not something I agree with, but I know Chris Hedges is a you know, popular figure on our side. He became one of the major propagandists for the Iraq War, and even uh, later on, he uh, even after all the evidence came out that there were no stockpile of WMDs, he claimed that the U.S. Uh, one of the U.S. envoys was lying in him in his denying 
uh, that there were reports at the time that uh, Iraq was trying to uh, buy weapons and buy nuclear weapons or chemical weapons. And he also, he basically never admitted uh, that he was wrong on that. And he always continued to argue the details of that and saying that there were certain evidence that Iraq was uh, trying to buy weapons of mass destruction and was uh, stockpiling them. He never uh, gave that up. At the same time, he increasingly, maybe that was because George Bush's government was uh, like sort of a start of religious rights really coming into American politics. He was very critical of all religious movements, all of them pretty much equally, including Buddhism. <laughs> and uh, he, he, but uh, yeah, basically early uh, knots, uh, you know, uh, and later on, he increasingly became involved in these debates and arguments against religion. And he became associated with uh, people like Bill Maher and Sam Harris and uh, uh, to Richard Dawkins, although I would put these people in completely different categories. He famously became part of a group, he became known as part of a group that are called Four, four Horsemen of Apocalypse because of their uh, vehement uh, disagreements with religious beliefs. Richard Dawkins, da Daniel Dennett, if I'm not mispronouncing his name, Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens, each from a different uh, field of uh, sciences. Uh, and uh, uh, he was very aggressive in his uh, style of debate which I personally liked. He was very direct and to the point. I would say, to be honest, he was much better when he was debating and talking uh, in a way, because sometimes when he wrote, I think he became a bit too aggressive and famously his rebuttal of Gore Vidal and his, uh, uh, his uh, articles when he had a problem with Chomsky, his articles about Chomsky, like pretty much calling them old fools or even perhaps, I think, harsher words. Uh, you know, uh, so as time went on, he be became involved with the new atheist movement. Oh, sorry, I just have a funny anecdote about what you just mentioned about his writing. I was just watching a video of him a few days ago, and he was talking about how he had a lot of problems writing until someone told him to just write the way he talks. So oh, maybe that makes sense when he went there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I guess if you call someone verbally old fool, <laughs> putting it in writing is much worse because it just like stays there. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe, maybe that's yeah. the thing. I would say, I, I mean, I loved his writing and his books and all yeah, that. I haven't but actually I just, read any of his writings, but I just heard that. Oh, it's pretty good. But uh, he even wrote novels and stuff. So, uh, but yeah, it's just that I didn't, I don't know, like with specifically with the figures that I personally respect this much. It was disappointing. That was one of my few disappointments with him uh, uh, and uh, the Iraq War. Disappointment is a bit like I'm his dad, like <laughs> things I didn't like as a fan. But wait, so but, at first he was friends with Gore Vidal and stuff, but then of course as his views changed, um, he became more yeah, yeah, confrontational they, they, towards them. Okay. Yes, yeah, sadly they became very, yeah, at the end of his life, they became, they had a very negative relationship. But at the time when they, they, they were... Early on, when he just moved to the U.S. in the 90s, a lot of people were saying that, I think it's commonly said that Hitchens was the heir apparent to Gore Vidal's, uh, you know, Gore Vidal's throne of uh, cynicism and uh, direct, uh, you know, direct challenge to the establishment and authority and all that, because they, they both probably shared the a style and they both had very negative views of religious authorities and you know and American imperialism at the time and stuff but then things changed and yeah he became associated with the new atheist movement and he had uh, there was a lot of uh, there is a lot of content of him online uh, on Bill Marshall uh, debating different people on uh, question and answer shows in Australia in UK so there's a lot of content online that you can check out to get to know his views as well later on. But yeah, I think, and uh, towards the end of his life, sadly, he, he, he was a heavy smoker. He was a heavy drinker. He got a sort of, a, I believe, a type of throat cancer and uh, very quickly passed away. He never, uh, you know, 
he never basically went back on any of his words and he did he specifically warned that people are gonna claim that I might have converted on my deathbed to a religion I haven't you know just like every famous who any famous atheist who dies some religious person later on comes up and says oh you know at the last day they they said they believed in God but um uh, and that, by the way, somebody, a religious person, an Angelican who was a friend of Hitchens, wrote a book about two years after his death and did claim that, yeah, in fact, he, in the last days of his life, he was thinking of converting. So, yeah, um, uh, but he, I would say his last interview with Newsnight, I think it's with Jeremy Paxman, if I'm not mistaken, is a very interesting one because I think he had a bit of a, was a bit of an actor. He was a bit of a showman. And I think... Sometimes that cost him a, too much a bit. I think, for example, in his, I think with the Iraq war, because especially because he stopped talking about it as much, I think he had basically with such a bolster and with such a, you know, he, he had made, he had defended it so strongly that he felt that he couldn't sort of go back on it, sort of, you know, when you defend something so strongly that you feel like, oh shit, I made a mistake, but it's, it's my own honor is involved now, or I, I would look like a fool, basically. So uh, I think that last interview is one of his most honest interviews, and you see his humanity in that so much. His last interviews, and because he knows he's passing away, he doesn't have that anger, maybe. And he's, uh, I mean, it's, I love his angry style, by the way. It's just, it's a glimpse into his humanity more than anything else. And you see that he was somebody, in my view, that was fighting his whole life for freedom of all humans all over the world uh, in an equal way. Even though I disagree with him on many issues, he was, uh, uh, he was genuine, he was brave, he was honest, and I do genuinely believe he, he did not believe, in, he believed people are separated based on their ideas, not based on their tribes, not based on their race, not based on their looks, not based on their uh, you know, uh, uh, hair color, you know, whatever, eye color, whatever you want to go with. Uh, so th that I really liked about him, that he never, even in, uh, we'll get into it, but like his, uh, he, the view he had of the Muslim world, a lot of Muslim, uh, a lot of people say he was, uh, he was, uh, you know, anti-Islamic, he was, a, he was racist towards Muslims or something like that. But I don't think that's true at all. And he's, to be honest, he's Palestinian journalistic where he, for many years, he did, he, uh, he contributed to a book with Edward Said, one of the most uh, pro prominent uh, people who, uh, who writes about Palestinian issues from a less leftist perspective. He did change his views later on in certain issues, but not completely ever. But uh, he was always, he never put anybody on a pedestal, basically, like a lot of people put you know, oh, you're from this minority, we should treat you. He was always uh, honest. Uh, he wanted equal equality for everybody, but he wouldn't put you on a pedestal. He wouldn't, he didn't have the soft racism of the liberals that a lot of nice liberals have. Oh, your experience might be so different coming from Middle East, as if Middle East is some, or, oh, in Africa, do they have... Uh, you know, uh, is, do you live in a hut or is the, or is the building, you know, he never had that uh, soft uh, racism that a lot of people have and he never put people on a pedestal, which I loved. And, you know, he, he realized that what he's described as the Islamic world is, you know, there are also, you know, we never, he didn't associate, he didn't, like, he realized that it's a pluralistic society, that the Islamic world is extremely pluralistic. There are atheists, there are agnostics, there are uh, different sects, you know, there are Christians, Kurds, blah, blah, blah. So he had a very global view that I really like. So uh, this was the a tiny brief biography of his career, because I don't think we are too interested in his personal life. But, uh, and my take and why I think he was somebody worth looking into, basically, uh, my two cents on the matter. But uh, just uh, while we are in his biography, though, I would say he was a big fan of uh, uh, Kipling and George Orwell, 
Uh, interestingly, he Olivia Wilde, which is a very famous actress. I don't know if you know, she's a very, very famous actress. I don't know. She, he had all these very personal connections with a lot of people. Like he was, he was the babysitter to Olivia Wilde. Apparently, he was a friend of her father or something. Her father was a diplomat or something. He was a good friend of Martin Amis and Salman Rushdie, famous British authors and novelists. He had all these, he was one of those people like Orson Welles and Gore Vidal, in my view, that had all these personal stories and, you know, fantastic connections and interesting, uh, you know, dinner parties he's been to. So he was a really fascinating character. Even his personal life is worth looking into, but this is not really something I covered in this, yeah. I thought, before on the carrier. 